Hi guys, it's Kamil here. I have some overdue reviews to do, right? As I promised. I already read it, so hopefully I will post a review relatively soon. So today I'm coming to you with a short review of Real Life by Brandon Taylor. Generally, when I read a book for a review, I try to stay away as much as possible, obviously, from the reviews already published in the press or online, including reviews on Booktube. Sometimes, though, some glimpses of what other people thought or what was the author's intention eventually get through to me. When I read Real Life by Brandon Taylor, I couldn't stop seeing similarities or references to A Little Life by Hane Nigahara. I wrote about it in my Instagram post. Shameless self-promotion. <laughs> and it was confirmed that indeed this book was written with Yanigahara's novel in mind. The title of Brandon Taylor's novel, Real Life, is already a very strong reference and indication that his novel is in a sort of literary discussion with a little life. It also gives you a heads up on how it will differ from Yanni Gahara's novel. The adjective real in Taylor's title is underlining that what Yanni Gahara wrote that queer novel so loved by a huge number of straight people, as great as it is, and I'm also a huge fan, is somewhat typical of the way queer life needs to be depicted in literature in order to be successful. Yanigahara not only created a typical sexual abuse victim type of a queer story, but she went farther than that. She extrapolated it to the almost unbearable levels. Intentionally so, I mean, if you had a chance to see my review that I posted a few years back, you know, I encourage you to do so. <laughs> uh, I also talked about that. Nonetheless, Taylor, as it seems, decided to create a realistic response. Um, he decided to depict sort of a more realistic version of queer life, intelligently borrowing various plot devices and undertones from Yanigahara's novel. Just like in Yanigahara's novel, we have the main protagonist here named Wallace, chased by a painful past of abuse and poverty. We meet him at a prestigious graduate school where he studies biochemistry. Just like in Yanni Gahara's novel, his life circles around a group of friends, and just like Yanni Gahara's Jude, Brandon Taylor's Wallace doesn't feel like he fully belongs with his group of friends because of his past and social background. But there's an additional reason different to Yanni Gahara's novel. Brandon Taylor's Wallace is black, while his friends are white. Already in the first paragraph, Brandon Taylor signals two aspects around which the dynamics of the novel will circulate. Wallace's father died a few weeks ago. That's one of the topics that will be further explored. And then the second element is signaled through what Wallace sees all around him at the local lake. And those are white people. The term white people, which within a few sentences is repeated twice, gives a strong indication that race and racial issues are going to be crucial and deeply explored in this novel. This is probably the most important difference that separates those two novels. Of course, except for the realism of real life versus sort of a dark fairy tale aspect of Yanni Gahara's A Little Life. Brandon Taylor creates a character that tries to find his way in a world dominated by white people. 
Taylor skillfully portrays how race affects the circumstances one is forced to navigate through. He does that most interestingly by contrasting Wallace, the main protagonist, with his friend Mila, his white friend, with somewhat similarly poor background, who despite of that is experiencing life at the university in a very different way. Miller, even though he also carries a dark past, is white, and therefore nobody questions his presence on the campus, his rights to be there. Miller never has to face those subtle or less subtle examples of racism. If Miller, a white man, failed at school, his options outside of the university are still significantly wider than those available to Wallace. There's a line in this book that speaks about it very strongly. Um, and it reads like, for Wallace to say that there could be nothing more than this, and by this we mean university life, meant only that if he should lose it, he might not survive his life. That's the main difference. There are two scenes where racism is being displayed the most visibly when at the party with his white friends and when Wallace works at the university lab. What's so important here, we have to remember that this is an educated environment, so racism is never vulgar, never outrageously so. It works differently. Just like in Yanigahara's novel, when thoughts of the main character are revealed, there's a lot of self-doubt, self-deprecation. And it's obvious that those are the words heard in the childhood, internalized by Wallace. This is one of those elements that make Wallace quite similar to Jude. Another aspect that Brandon Taylor does impressively well is the recreation of the feelings, the tones of frustration and hopelessness. And I'm not talking about the characteristics exposed by the main character. I'm talking about the feelings evoked in a reader. I remember when I was reading real life, especially when I was reading about those racist remarks, I was feeling frustrated, irritated, thinking why nobody is speaking up, why Wallace's friends are just tolerating it, why Wallace is tolerating it. And then I realized that this is exactly what I felt when I was reading A Little Life, for different reasons, but the feelings were very similar. I was frustrated, irritated, and I felt helpless. And I know that those were exactly the reasons why a lot of people hated A Little Life, but I loved it for that, as hardly Ever, any book evokes as strong reactions in me as Little Life did. And just for the same reasons, among the others, I appreciated real life. The final verdict? I don't think real life is a groundbreaking novel in the grand scheme of things, but it's a very strong debut. It's well written, it provokes a lot of reflections in terms of class and race, and it is in a witty literary discussion with, like it or not, one of the most important queer texts that were published in the last few years. This aspect is especially interesting, as I think it's quite brave to create a book that would be in such a strong discussion, often very critical discussion, most of the time critical discussion, with the book published so recently and so famously, but in the same time managed to create a work that speaks on its own terms. Taylor text also reads very smoothly. I remember I read it after How Much of This Hills is Gold by Sipam Chang, which was a bit of work to get through, while through real life I just look. I've heard some complaints about Brandon Taylor's writing style, that his sentences are overwritten and it's harder to get through. I totally don't get that. Totally don't get that. Sure, sometimes they are long, but so what? 
that long for a reason. But you know, I'm always quite confused when somebody reading in their mother tongue complains about the writing style. Try to read regularly in your acquired language. Really. <laughs> I mean, I hear those type of complaints across the board. I hear it from English native speakers reading in English, from Polish native speakers reading in Polish. But for me, as much as the writing is a stylistic choice and it's not just bad and clunky, I'm always super puzzled when somebody says that the book was hard to get through because of the language. But I said it, I always wanted to be honest. Uh, okay guys, let me know what you thought about this one. If you read it, I would love to talk with you down in the box below. Uh, if you liked it, leave a comment, thumbs up or whatever. I am a bit horrid myself right now. <laughs> Regardless. Uh, yeah, and I talk to you soon. Bye bye guys.